Good morning. Good to see all of your smiling faces today. Welcome to the sunny south. It was uh, 19 degrees at my house this morning. Yeah, that's a little chilly for down here. Well, this morning we are going to start a new series that I think will be an encouragement to you. I think it will be a blessing to you. And um, it will help you walk in some things, I believe, that will uh, that'll help change your life. The series is The Abundant Life. We're going to be looking here in our Bibles, first of all, at 2 Timothy chapter 2, and we'll look at verse 15. So 2 Timothy chapter 2. And we'll begin reading here in verse 15. Now, let me remind you that the book of Timothy is the Apostle Paul writing to a young pastor by the name of Timothy uh, that the Apostle Paul has brought up in the Lord, mentored, discipled, if you will. Uh, Timothy is the pastor at the church at Ephesus. Quite a responsibility. And so the Apostle Paul is writing him here in verse 15. He says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, if the Apostle Paul is admonishing Timothy here to rightly divide the word of truth, that implies that it is possible to wrongly divide the word. And typically, the way that you can make the distinction, the way that you can go about this safely is you look at the Bible, you translate the Bible, you study the Bible in light of other scriptures. So you, you uh, I, some people word it this way, you emphasize the things that the Bible emphasizes and you don't emphasize the things that the Bible does not emphasize or major on the majors and minor on the minors. So by looking at other scripture and finding what the Bible teaches consistently is a good way of rightly dividing the word of truth. So he also, matter of fact, I want you to uh, drop down with me to verse 22. He says, flee also youthful lust. By the way, that's the only place in the New Testament that the Bible tells you to run from something. Flee youthful lust. But pursue righteousness, faith, love, peace without those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. Now, one of the things that he's, he's instructed Timothy to rightly divide the word of truth. And he's also told him, a joy or, or avoid ignorant disputes. Have you ever been around people that just want to argue? I mean, they just want to argue about all kinds of stuff. And I'm talking in particular where the Bible is concerned. They just want to argue the Bible. You know, I made a decision years ago. I'm not going to argue with somebody. First of all, I'm not trying to get somebody to believe the way that I believe. I'm not trying to convince people to believe the way that I believe. What I'm trying to do is to show them the word and let them come to their own conclusion. But most times, most problems that people have is a result of ignorance. And I don't mean that ugly. I just mean a lack of knowledge. They don't study the Bible. They don't know what it says. And if you don't know what the Bible says, then you have to start making up stuff. I mean, if you're going to have some type of belief system and it's not based on the Word, then you, you've got to plug things in. You've got to substitute something for that Word. Well, where church is concerned, uh, where... where uh, 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 religious things are concerned it's religion or traditions of men doctrines of men that are substituted in there that jesus said over mark chapter 7 would cause the word of god itself to be to have no effect it takes it robs the power out of the word so avoid uh, foolish and ignorant disputes knowing that they generate strife and a servant of the lord must not quarrel but be gentle to all able to teach in patience Verse 25 in particular, I want you to notice here. In humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil 
having been taken captive by him to do his will. So this is really important. Verse 25 uh, in the King James Bible, I like the way that it's worded there. It says, uh, in teaching those that oppose themselves. So someone that doesn't rightly divide the word of truth, in other words, they cherry pick things, they take verses of scripture out of their context and out of their setting. What happens is, is it winds up causing them to oppose themselves. You know, it's really good for us to understand what the Bible teaches where healing is concerned. And we've looked at that over the last several weeks in the series, The Mirror of Faith. It's good to know what the Bible teaches where peace is concerned. The Bible word for peace, the Hebrew word for peace is shalom. And the word shalom literally means nothing missing, nothing broken. Now, isn't that a good thing to have in your life? Is nothing missing and nothing broken. So it's good to know what the word says in these particular things. It's good to know what the word says in the area of finances. It's, it's good to know what the word says in the area of direction and the leading of the Lord. So we can find when we go to scripture, we can find what the Bible is telling us there. We can stand on those particular verses of scripture and we can have the results that the Bible says that we have. So here he, he instructs Timothy. He said, I want you to teach people. Now do it in a spirit of meekness. Do it with humility. Don't argue. Don't quarrel with them. Don't get involved in vain disputings. But teach them with a spirit of humility so that they will not oppose themselves. And by opposing themselves, what happens in verse 26 that they can come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, having been taken captive by him to do his will. So if you don't properly divide the word of God, then what can happen is, is you can wind up opposing yourself and fall into a snare that uh, actually causes you to be taken captive. So we don't want to do that. In case y'all are wondering, we don't want to do that. All right? Now, I want you to look over in with me to uh, John's Gospel, keeping that in mind. John chapter 10. Let's begin reading in verse 7. John 10 and verse 7. Jesus is talking here about being the shepherd, the good shepherd. He is the door that the sheep come through. He's the sheep gate. And in verse 7 he says, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I've come that they may have life, and that they might have it more abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. And I know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I want you to pay attention here to verse 16. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Verse 16 is talking about what? talking about the church he's he's giving a reference here remember all throughout the scriptures we've looked at several examples jesus uses a term that he was sent to the lost sheep of the house of israel jesus was sent to the nation of israel and and we know that we know that with the scriptures prophesied that he would be coming as the savior of israel but isaiah tells us and then here jesus uh, tells us here that, that he has another flock also that he's got to bring in so that we can be one 
flock so that we can come in and have one uh, come in under one shepherd. So he's talking here about the church. Now I want you to go back to verse 10. The thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and they may have it more abundantly. Now I want you to think about this particular verse of Scripture with what we looked at over in 2 Timothy a few minutes ago. People that oppose themselves set a snare for the devil or the devil's work. Those snares are set for the individual so that the enemy can do what? So that he can either try to steal, kill, or destroy them. That's what his plan is. Jesus' plan in your life is to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. As a matter of fact, I, I, like, I heard this the other night. This was at one of our Bible studies. Somebody said this. I didn't come up with it, but I thought it was really good, and I'm going to use it. They said, if Jesus were around today and he had business cards, John 10.10 10 would be on his business card. Yep, I've come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. That, that would be on his, on his business card. Yep, come to give you life and give it to you more abundantly. Now, the word life here is the word zoe. This isn't the word life that means breath or, uh, uh, or, 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 or just a, a sense of being alive. That's not what this word means. This word is the literally the God kind of life, the abundant life. As a matter of fact, the Amplified Bible brings that out. It says, I came that they may have and enjoy life and have it in abundance to the full till it overflows. God's desire in your life is for your life to be so full to be so abundant in every area of your life till it overflows. That's what God's will is. says it right here. Jesus said that's why you can. So if you ever wonder whether God wants you to succeed, if you ever wonder whether God wants you to be healthy, if you ever wonder if God wants you to be prosperous, if you ever wonder if God wants you to be at peace, if you ever wonder if God wants you to operate in wisdom and knowledge, you don't have to want. He wants you to operate in the fullness of the God kind of life in every area of your life. And Jesus paid the price for that. So that we can walk in the fullness of God in er every area of our life. But, but let me share something with you. And this is something that we learned when we were talking about uh, the mirror of faith. And we were talking about, I would make this statement. And that statement is, and, and, and the reason I do this where healing is concerned is it, it oftentimes, it, or it appears over the years, that people are able to relate to this a little easier. And so I would make the statement, is it always God's will to heal? And, and over all the weeks that we took on that, we came to the conclusion, yes, it is always God's will to heal. There is not an example in the New Testament that somebody asks God for healing and he tells them no. I know you may think you know of a few places. You don't. There's not a place in the New Testament where somebody asks God for healing and he says no. So we know that it's the will of God for us to walk in healing, but yet not everybody gets healed. And the thing that we learn that is so very important, so vital, not only where healing is concerned, but where the other things of God are concerned, that enable us to walk in the abundant life. And that is this. It is God's will for you to walk in abundant life. Not everybody walks in abundant life. So what's the thing in the middle? What's the transition? The transition is, can you believe? Can you believe? For healing can you believe to prosper can you believe to be at peace can you believe to walk in wisdom now the problem that people have with that is this people in general just just humans in general 
do not like to assume responsibility. And this is kind of where things start coming off the tracks for a lot of people, and that is that they realize that they have some responsibility where this is concerned. They have something to do. The outcome has a lot to do with them. Now, we don't want that. We want God to take care of everything and just just handle it. And if God wants it handled, he'll handle it. If he doesn't want it handled, he, uh, then he won't handle it. And if it, and if it doesn't get fixed, then it, it was not his will for that to work and all kinds of stuff. And so what happens is, is we start believing or we start going down a path that is not based and founded on the word. It's based and founded on traditions. Uh, it's based and founded on uh, uh, our, our, our humanistic way of thinking. So God's desire is for you to have these things, but you have some responsibility where, it is, where, where these things are concerned. And that is, we have to believe. In other words, we have to exercise our faith. The way that you are going to operate, the way you are going to walk in the abundant life is by operating in faith. You have got to develop your faith for each one of these different areas. Listen, you know where the Bible tells us to walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. That's not saying that you become saved by works. That's talking about once you are saved, there is a whole lot to learn. And you start walking things out and learning things. You start growing in the wisdom, the fullness of the measure, the stature of Christ. As you're a believer, you should grow and mature in things. And in so doing, by becoming familiar with what the Word says in particular areas, then you start growing, and your faith starts growing, and you start having better results. Does that mean that everything works all the time? Nope. You're going to mess up. We're all going to mess up. But you still keep striving. You still keep working things out. By the way, do you know where our undoing usually is? When we're trying to walk these things out, our undoing is usually with our mouth. Our mouth is usually our, under, our our mouth will contradict what it is that we are believing. So it is God's will, it is God's desire that we walk in the abundant life, the God kind of life. Listen, can you imagine what it was like being around Jesus? Can you imagine? Do you do you think the disciples worried when they were around Jesus? Do you think they worried about what they were going to eat? Do you think the disciples, when they were around Jesus, worried about getting sick? Do you think they worried about paying their bills? When they were around Jesus, they were usually, from what we can tell, with a few exceptions, there was that boat incident when they thought they were going to die. That was when he went ahead and went to sleep and the storm came up and scared him. There was that incident that Peter thought he was going to drown when he stepped out of the boat. But for the most part, being around Jesus uh, provided contentment. Hanging around Jesus, things went well for them. Hanging around Jesus, they walked in health. You know, I, I don't recall an example in our Bible, an incident in our Bible, of one of the disciples being sick. Do you? I, I don't. Now, I know Peter's mother-in-law uh, was sick, and, and there are some that believe that that's why he denied the Lord three times, is because Jesus healed her, but that I don't think is true. So there were, there, we, we have that, but we don't have any of the disciples that, that were sick that were it's recorded in our Bible. The only time we ever find uh, a, a, an example of them being even slightly a financial situation was paying their taxes, and Jesus told them to go fish, go go fishing, and the fish that you catch, look in their mouth, and there'll be coins there for you to pay your taxes and my taxes and everybody's taxes. Just pay the taxes. Now, that doesn't mean if you're trying to pay your income tax now to go fish. That does, that's not what, 
that, that was, there was obedience that was involved there where Jesus was concerned and where Peter was concerned. So from the most part, we can tell that by, by hanging around Jesus, things went pretty good in their life. Is that correct? Well, hey, I've got good news for you. The same is true today. Hanging around Jesus, things will go a lot better in your life. Now, you can't hang around with him personally in the flesh like they were. But you can hang around him through his word. You can fellowship with him through his word. And as you spend time in the Bible learning and studying, and the Spirit of God reveals things to you, You'll walk in the things like the disciples did. You'll walk in that abundant life to a greater degree. You know, the Bible tells us that we're supposed to be an example. That non-believers ought to look at our life and think, I want to be like them. You know, it just seems like whatever comes their way, it just seems like that nothing shakes them. They just, they don't seem to worry about stuff. Well, worrying is a byproduct of fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. A person who is a faith person, a person who th- that walks in faith, remember the just shall live by faith. Y'all remember that? A person that learns to do that doesn't operate in fear, doesn't operate in worry. If you're operating in faith, faith doesn't give place. To worry. If you're operating in faith and love, the Bible says perfect love casts out fear. Casts out fear. So the abundant life is something that we're trying to attain. The abundant life is something that Jesus tells us that he has come and provided for us. So how is it that we're going to get there? Romans chapter 12 kind of bears out what we've been talking about here. Turn with me. Uh, Uh, Back to Romans 12. Romans 12, chapter, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Now, I want you to notice something here in this particular verse of Scripture. It says that I beseech you or admonish you, brethren, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, who does the Bible say is supposed to present your body as a sacrifice? We are. The individual. Lord, I'm just asking right now that you take this desire for smoking away from me. Is that presenting your body a living sacrifice? No. Nope. You're the one that does it. Uh, by the way, ha- have you ever had someone try to help you present yourself? <laughs> you present your body? A living sacrifice? Have you ever noticed it doesn't work as good when somebody else gets on to you about something? If you're trying to deal with with, with something of the flesh, if you're trying to deal with a habit or things like that, it doesn't do near as good if people keep reminding you of it. Who has to do that? We do. The Bible doesn't say that God's going to just take it from you. Well, if the Lord doesn't want me to do that, He'll just take all desire from it. That's not you presenting your body a living sacrifice. We are supposed to do it. We're supp- now listen, if the Bible instructs us to do that, don't you think then we have the ability to do it? I've just tried this for years. I can't do it. We're, supposed to, we're the ones that are supposed to present ourselves. A living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I want you to notice here in verse 2, it says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by 
the renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind is what's going to help you walk in the abundant life. You have to change the way that you think. See, one of the things that happens, and one of the things that we need to understand, is when you are born again, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, a wonderful thing happens. And that is the Spirit of the living God makes alive, recreates, whatever term you want to use, your spirit. Now, your spirit wasn't dead in the sense that it ceased to exist. It was dead in the sense of being separated from God through sin or depravity. And so when you accept the price that Jesus has paid, then the Spirit of God is now able to work and to make your spirit alive unto God. When you are born again, you are not going to become any more alive unto God than you are right then. You're not going to become any more righteous than you are right then. Now that's good news. The way that the Apostle Paul describes it, writing to the Corinthian church, he said, he says, when this happens to you, that you are a new creature. And that word creature, there's a very interesting word that means you are a new class of being. This class of being hasn't existed before. I know of one well-known minister that refers to it this. When you are born again, you become a God-man. Right? I mean, God's on the inside of you. you, you you've been made alive unto God. You're a different class of being. You're energized. You're, you're, you're made alive by the Spirit of the living God. That's where your spirit is concerned. Your mind, your soul, which is your mind, will, and emotions, it is not, <laughs> nothing happens to it. So, here, when a person is saved, their spirit is alive unto God. There's been a change in that, we say a change in their heart. But unfortunately, we still have the same stinking thinking. We still think like we did yesterday. And what has to happen is, and now it's a lot easier because your spirit is sensitive to the things of God, we have to start changing the way that we think. Because it is not natural, excuse me, our natural way of thinking is enmity, the Bible says, with God. We don't think the way that God thinks. Our fallen state, our sinful nature doesn't think the way that God thinks. So we have to start changing the way that we think. We have to start understanding that God's for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? That God desires for us abundant life. That God desires for us good things. And we have to start telling ourselves that. We have to start sowing that until your mind starts thinking that way. Listen, it doesn't happen in a day. It's a process on a daily basis to renew our mind to the things of God. 1 Timothy 6, 17. You don't have to turn there. You can just write it down if you want to, or, or you can. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, is actually, no, I, want you, I, I do want you to turn there. 1 Timothy, chapter 6. Uh, let's look at verse 17. Command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, nor to trust in uncertain riches. He didn't say there was anything wrong with having riches. The area that he says to address is, don't trust in your riches. Put your trust in God. Does that sound a little like Matthew 6.33? Seek 
first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all the things will be added to you. Nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who gives... Now look at this. In your, this is in your Bible. Who gives us richly all things to enjoy. Now he's been addressing the rich starting back about verse 9. He, he, he's talking about this. And he's talking about the distinction, how to, how to properly look at this. And what you'll notice in his writings, you'll notice the emphasis on don't trust in the riches. There's nothing wrong with the riches. As a matter of fact, part of the redemptive act of the Lord Jesus was he, be, he was rich and became poor so that we through his poverty might be made rich. Well, you're going to walk in that to the degree that your mind is renewed. You're going to walk in that to the, to the degree that you are able to walk in faith where that's concerned. And so to, the, the first thing that has to start happening is we have to start renewing our mind to the fact that it, that it is God's will for us to operate in these things. And one of the areas where finances are concerned is, is right here. And that is that people trust in their money. They trust in their wealth. That's dangerous. You do remember that the Bible tells us that God is a jealous God and that he will have no other gods before him. <laughs> uh, don't put money ahead of him. Nothing wrong with it. God wants you to have. Listen, do you know why God wants you to have abundance? He wants you to have abundance so that you can show the love of God to other people, so you can be a blessing to other people. You're his representatives in the earth. Was Jesus a blessing to other people? Yes. Does God want you to be a blessing to other people? Yes. I have found over the years it's a lot easier to be a blessing to other people when you yourself are blessed. Right? It's difficult to be a blessing to other people when you're not blessed. It's difficult to, to, to help people financially when you yourself are not blessed financially. Verse 18. Let them do good that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share. Storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. 2 Peter 1.3 also bears this out. 2 Peter 1.3 says, As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life. By the way, that word life there is the word Zoe, the God kind of life that's over in John 10, 10. Same word. So he's talking about the same thing. He has given to us all things. Do you notice over in 1 Timothy 6, 17, he's given, God's given us richly all things to enjoy. Here in 2 Peter, he says, all things that pertain to life in godliness. What are things? Things are things, right? Are houses things? Cars things? Clothes things? Things are things. And, he say, and, and, and God doesn't mind you having things. He's given us richly all things to enjoy. Enjoy it. God, does God mind you having things? Not according to these verses of Scripture, He does it. But what He does mind is the, is the things are the things having you. If the things become the most important thing, if your focus is on acquiring things, that's the problem. The goal is to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and the things will be added to you. The blessings of the Lord maketh one rich, 
and he adds no sorrow with it. You want to be able to enjoy abundance. And the way to enjoy abundance in your life is by putting God first in your life. Philippians chapter 4, turn there with me, you'll, you'll like this. Philippians chapter 4, let's see if there's maybe some other evidence of abundant life in our Bible. Philippians 4.13, we know Philippians 4.13, you love Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So, if you can do all things, that's when the Bible also says, nothing shall be impossible to him that believes. All these things are available. Drop down to verse 19 in Philippians chapter 4. And my God shall supply all your need. I want you to notice that that word is not plural. It's because God doesn't. God lumps every, God lumps need as need. I, I know that there are a lot of people that try to. When you're talking about prosperity, they try to make a distinguish between. Well, see, brother, that's talking about spiritual prosperity as opposed to natural prosperity. No, when it's talking about rich, like when it says that Jesus was uh, rich, he he was rich, became poor for our sake, that we might become rich. That word is mammon, means money. And how many of you know that if you are blessed spiritually, it will find its way out into the natural realm? So my God shall supply all of your need according... Now I want you to notice this. I want you to notice the standard that God uses here. My God shall supply all of your need according to something. And the thing that that's according to is according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. That's how God supplies your need. Remember over Luke chapter 6, given it's given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will men give in to your bosom for the same measure that you meet? It'll be measured back to you again. That's abundant life. That's using God's standard. God measures things to you. Now, this isn't talking about just money, although he is talking about that they gave to his need when he was in Thessalonica. He had need of some things, and the church at Philippi sent the Apostle Paul money while he was there in Thessalonica. And so he's commending them back, thanking them. He said, look, I've learned whatever state I'm in to, to, to be happy, to be content. But I sure do appreciate you giving. It sure was a blessing. And because you gave, God's going to supply all of your need according to His riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Abundant life. Abundant living. Go with me to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9. We'll, we'll close here for today. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. I love this, I love this passage of Scripture. 2 Corinthians 9, let's start, oh, about um, maybe verse 6, 2 Corinthians 9, 6. But this I say, he who spore, uh, sows sparingly, spores, the word spores is a combination of the word sparingly and sow. You combine those words together, you come out with spores. Okay. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparing and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully so let each one give as he purposes in his heart not grudgingly or of necessity for god loves a cheerful giver and that word cheerful there means hilarious over the top giver and the reason this person can be so cheerful is they understand the principle that's following they understand that when I give bountifully, it's given back to me bountifully. 
Have I mentioned to you, I probably hadn't, I hadn't said this in a long time, everything operates on the principle of seed time and harvest. Everything operates on seed time and harvest. You sow a little, you'll get a little. You sow a lot, you'll get a lot. And God is able to make, I want you to notice the superlatives in this particular passage of Scripture. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Now that's pretty good, isn't it? As it is written, he has dispersed abroad, he has given to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. Now may he who supplies seed to the sower. God even gives you the seed to sow. Matter of fact, that is one, let me, let me help you with something. One of the easiest things for you to believe for financially is for seed. If you, if you have a need, sow a seed. If you have a need in your life, you don't have to have all of what it is to meet that need. All you have to have is the seed to sow that causes the harvest to meet the need. And the Bible says that if you are a sower, that God will even provide the seed for you. And bread for your food. He'll supply and multiply the seed that you have sown, not seed that you have in the barn. He multiplies the seed that you've sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness while you are enriched in everything. Oh, do you notice that how many things are in this? The verses of Scripture that we've looked at today, how many things are in there? While you are enriched in everything for all liberality, which causes thanksgiving through us to God. One of the reasons that God blesses you so much is because it causes us to give thanksgiving to Him, to praise Him. Now that's really important. When God blesses you, thank Him for it. I mean, just have good manners. When somebody gives you a gift, isn't it good manners to thank them for it? Well, how much more where God is concerned? How much more where... When He blesses us, He's the one that provides us the seed in the first place. When we sow it, He then causes the seed to multiply bountifully that harvest to come back to us that we're enriched in everything with all liberality which should cause thanksgiving towards God. We're talking about the abundant life. We're talking about living life to its fullest in every area of your life. And one of the things that we've got to do where this is concerned is to renew our mind, renew our thinking to what the Word says about this. Remember, your faith is only, only going to operate where the will of God is known. So we've got to look at what the Word says where these things are concerned and renew our mind, tweak the way that we think, so that we'll learn to think the way that the Word says, and we'll have what it is that the Bible says that we'll have. Amen? Amen. Well, I sure hope you got a lot out of that today. hope it was a blessing to you. My desire is that God's richest and best are yours. And remember, there's victory in Jesus. Amen. As I tithe and give offerings, I'm believing the Lord for vision and direction, jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, discounts and dividends, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all my financial needs that I may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you agree with that, say amen.